In this video, I'm going to demonstrate how to use Spring Framework 6 and its support for declarative HTTP clients. I'm going to pick up where I left off on a previous video where I showed how to use problem details and RFC 7807 support in Spring Framework 6. I'm going to pick up from there. I'm going to use the same API when I create my client. So just as a reminder, in case you haven't watched the video or you just need a refresher, my API is fairly simple. It takes a request that has a Teams controller that takes a request and handles get requests for Teams slash whatever the team name is slash stadium and it returns back information about the stadium for whatever particular team name is specified. And it only knows about NFL teams. So Cowboys, Chargers, Broncos, Jets, Giants, things like that. It does not know about other sports or even non-professional sports. It only knows about the NFL. And so if you were to ask it for stadium information for the Yankees, it's not going to work. Just to give you a quick reminder of how that looks, it looks a little like this. I can say HTTP, HTTP I'm using HTTP IE as my client, port 8080 slash teams slash Broncos slash stadium. And it's going to give me back some details about the stadium that the Broncos play in. Or if I change the, the team name to something like Rams, it's going to come back with SoFi Stadium, which tells me details about that stadium. And it, in fact, it shows that the Chargers also play at that stadium. So if I were to change this to Chargers, I get the same information. That's the API in a nutshell. There's more we could talk about, and it is, it is in fact covered in the other video. But for this video, I just want to use that API and create a client for it. Now, we're going to move this editor out of the way. The API is already running, as you can see. And we are going to bring over another editor in which I've already started a client application. Now, it's a very simple Spring Boot application. I've used Spring Start Boot Starter Web Flux. I, have, of course, have the test dependencies that go along with all that. And I also added this one dependency here that is simply because I'm running on a Mac uh, M1. I've noticed that in the case of Mac M1, you get these weird little exceptions. Everything works, but you end up with these, these odd exceptions trying to resolve some native libraries on an M1. By putting this dependency in, that those, those things go away. It just quits complaining. It works either way, but this dependency keeps that from complaining all the time, and it keeps the, the logs a little bit neater. Also, even though I'm using Webflux, I am never, I'm not going to start a server here. So I've set Spring Main Web Application Type to None. So it won't, it won't start a server. It'll fire up, it'll do its job, and it'll go away. But I need to have Webflux in place because Webflux is going to be the basis for how the declarative clients work. And of course, I have just your basic run-of-the-mill Spring Boot Bootstrap applic uh, application, main application class. With that said, let's define what we want our client to do. And to do that, we're going to create an uh, interface called teamclient.java. I'm going to change this to be an interface. And the things we want it to do, I mean, we can, we can list out a number of things here, but the main thing we want it to do is we want it to return stadium information for a given team. And since this is reactive, I'm going to use the mono type. It's going to return a stadium. Now, I don't have a stadium type in my client yet, but we'll deal with that in a second. So it'll give me an error until we sort that out, but it'll be fine for now. Stadium, and I'm going to say get stadium for team. That'll be the name of the method. And we're going to pass in a team name. That's it. That's our interface. Let's go create that stadium type before we go any further. Call it stadium.java. Now, it could be a class, but it's easier if it's a record. And even though we already have a stadium type, I could have copied it over from the, from the API itself and then just got rid of some of the persistence annotations around it. But just might as well. It's just a simple record. It's easy enough to do. Might as well toss in um, our own copy of it here. And what's neat about doing it here is we don't necessarily, as a client, don't necessarily have to have all the same properties. We may want the ID. We may want the stadium name. We may want it. We may want the capacity. Maybe we're interested in the city and the state, but we don't really care about what turf is on the field. What we don't care about whether the roof is retractable or not. 
things like that. We just simply want some basic information about the stadium. All right, there's our stadium type. There's our team client. And now we need to declare this as a, as a client. And the way we do that is we put an HTTP exchange annotation on the, inter, on the interface and we pass in the location of the service. Now, the, I'm running this on localhost 8080, the, the API itself, so simple enough to do that. And then down here, I need to tell it exactly how it's going to fetch that information and what the path is on that. So for that, I need to put a git exchange. And the git exchange is gonna take, as a parameter, the path to the request. So it's localhost 8080, yes, but the path is teams, placeholder team name slash stadium. Come down here, we need to put a path variable. Now this, this path variable annotation, this should look familiar if you're familiar with Spring MVC or Webflux. It's the very same annotation. And it just indicates that whatever is passed in to this team name will be, be given to the request that is made to the from the client to the API. It's kind of in reverse of what it does if on the API side. If in Spring MVC or Webflux, it's whatever value is placed in this part of the path ends up getting sent into the method. It's the opposite here. It's whatever is sent in to the method gets sent on the request to the API. All right, we're, we've done a lot of the basic stuff here. There's a couple of other things we need to do to kind of make this work. We need to declare a couple of beans. And specifically, we need to declare beans that uh, define that interface as a bean. So bean team client. We'll call it team client. And it could throw an exception. In fact, it might. So on, on what we're about to do here, and I'm going to take and I'm going to use a, a nice little convenient private method here to kind of be a helper. And the reason I'm doing this, I could actually embed all of this in the same method, but then I wouldn't be able to use the same proxy HTTP service proxy factory. I wouldn't be able to use that over and over again on any other clients I may create. Now I'm only gonna create one in this video, but if I created others, I could continue to reuse this exact same thing uh, for other beans, for other client beans. And this is going to use a web client, which is, as you may be aware, is the reactive client, uh, HTTP client that Spring provides. It's roughly analogous to the good old fashioned REST template, but very different in how it works. It's, uh, first off, it's reactive in nature, but also just interacting with it is very different. It has much more of a, a request builder interface than a, a series of methods that you call. But we're not going to use any of that stuff today. We're just going to simply declare one. I'm going to say web client dot builder. Whoops, got two dots in there. Dot builder dot build. That's going to give us our web client. But then we're going to create this adapter, this web client adapter. Call it client and it'll be a web client adapter for the web client that we created above. Great. Finally, the last thing we need to do in this method is return an HTTP service proxy factory, use its builder to pass in our client, and we're going to ask it to build. It's just as simple as that. So now that we've defined that, bean, that private method that we can use, we can use it up here. We can say return HTTP service proxy factory dot create client and the client we're interested in creating it's a team client and what this this does these this private method as well as this being what this does is at startup time it's going to ca cause spring to create an implementation for the team client interface and that inter that implementation it creates will know how to talk to the api to make requests so just as a reminder, this is these are the beans that create that client. This is the bean that defines that client. And of course, we're dealing with stadiums, which are pretty basic. All right, right, let's. we've got everything in place. We just need to kick this thing off. We need something that's going to make it go. And for that, my, my favorite way of doing something when an application starts is to use an application runner bean. And we can name it whatever you want. I usually like to call them go in this particular case. And it's going to return, in the case of, a, uh, in this case, we're returning a, a Lambda. And so this Lambda implements the application runner interface, which is a functional interface. It has one method in it called run, and it takes 
set of arguments has its arguments, which we're going to uh, dutifully ignore. Instead, I'm going to pass in my team client being here. It's going to get injected into this when I create it. And then I'm going to be able to say uh, team client dot, oops, dot get stadium for team. And we'll pass in a team here. Let's pick a team we haven't chosen in any of the examples before. Let's go with the Vikings. So we're going to pass in the Vikings for this one. And then we're going to do an on next. And so whenever that stadium comes in, for each stadium in that mono that is returned from get stadium, which there should be only be one because it's it's a mono after all, we're going to say sys out. Um, put a oops. Put a couple of blank lines in there just to kind of break it apart from any of the other logging that takes place. We'll say stadium, and then we'll just output maybe just the name of the stadium. Nothing, nothing fancy. And then we'll throw in a few other blank lines in there just to kind of so it stands out a little bit. And the last thing we need to do here is we need to subscribe to the mono because that's that's what you do with monos and fluxes is somebody has to subscribe to them. Now what I'm about to do instead is something I don't generally recommend. In fact, I advise against it. However, for a demo, it's kind of nice. Uh, so I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to block. And what a block does is it blocks the thread and waits for that, that, that mono to complete before it does anything. And in fact, block will, will itself, in this case, return a stadium object. So I could return the stadium and then sys out it outside of the, the mono if I wanted to. The main reason I'm doing this is because it's just a convenient, easy, one-liner way of blocking the mono so that the exterior thread, the application thread, doesn't end, doesn't die before the mono completes. Otherwise, I'll get an error and it's just not going to work. So in a, in a server application, the server thread will keep this thing alive just fine. But this is not a server application. I've turned off the server. We're not going to have a netty server running or anything like that. And so essentially, once this go gets called, it's going to end very quickly, but that mono may not end as quickly as the main thread. So calling block will, will kind of, it's an easy, convenient one-liner to make the thread block or make it wait for the results for, um, for this mono. And it'll give us, give us a chance to sys out the answer is really all it is. Uh, again, I, I don't recommend block in general, but this is a good example of when I might use it and in an example app, I'm totally okay with it. All right, so there we go. We have everything in place. Let's kick this off. So I'm gonna go over here to the Spring Boot uh, dashboard. I'm gonna fire up my application. We're gonna wait for it to start up. And with any luck, we should see a stadium that, in fact, there it is, that the Vikings play in. It's the US Bank Stadium. Let me zoom, in, zoom in on that, a little bit easier to read. But US Bank Stadium. And just to kind of kick this a little bit more, just to prove to you that it's it's not just doing something weird hard coding wise, we can change the name of the team. Maybe I shouldn't zoom in quite as much. We'll change the name of the team that we're looking for. Maybe from Vikings, maybe we'll pick another team. How about the Seahawks? We'll kick it one more time. Wait for it to run. And we're going to see that the Seahawks play in Lumen Field. All right, great. So let's recap. What have we done here? Well, what we've done is we've got an API of some sort. Now, it happens to be an API that I wrote, but it could be any API. And we have an API we'd like to create a client for it. We've declared the client to do get stadium for team. And it does that by making it a get request to HTTP localhost 8080 slash teams slash some placeholder for the team name slash stadium. And this placeholder for that team name is passed in as a path variable when we call get stadium for team. Back over here in the application, we declare a bean that, with some help from a private method, creates, at startup time, creates an implementation for that interface using the clues that were given to it in the annotations. And then finally, we use that client in our Go, in our application runner, although this could be injected into any bean in this application and, and used from there. I just use an application runner as a convenient way of kicking it off as the application started up. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I certainly hope you learned something from it. Follow me on Twitter. I tweet about all sorts of stuff there, and I'm also available on Mastodon now. 
So check out my Mastodon account. Follow me there as well. And check out my books. The book on the left is Spring in Action, the sixth edition. It covers up to Spring Framework 5 because, unfortunately, Spring Framework 6 just came out and the book hasn't had an opportunity to catch up with that yet. But Spring Framework 5, a lot of great material in there, a lot of great stuff you can do with the Spring Framework. And if you're not familiar with Spring already, this is a great introduction to that topic. Also, check out the book on the right. It's a book on developing talking applications for Amazon Alexa. I'm very excited about the opportunities afforded by voice application development, and that book will help you get you started developing voice applications for Alexa. Well, until next time, thank you very much, and I'll see you on the next video.